All right, guys, in this video, we're going to be looking at some sample AP Physics 2 questions dealing with uh, Unit 4 content, which is electric circuits, which includes internal resistance uh, and circuits that have both resistors and capacitors. So question one says, a student plans to determine the resistivity of a specific type of material. To do this, the student will use wires constructed of the metal with known dimensions that are connected to a variable power source. The potential difference across the current through each wire are measured and the resistance of each is calculated. The resistance is used to determine the resistivity. Which of the following should be kept constant to ensure that the resistivity values are consistent and why? So remember, um, this question will actually deal with the idea that temperature can affect the resistance of material and therefore that material's resistivity. So uh, the first choice is the potential difference across the wires because then only the currents will be different. Or B, the current in the wires because then only the resistance will be different. C, the lengths of the wires because the resistivity changes with length which is not true. The resistivity is something that's constant for a material regardless of length, surface area, well, length or surface area. So the thing that they need to make sure stays the same is the temperature of the wires um, because the resistivity can change with temperature. Number two, kind of getting to the same idea of the resistivity or resistances um, effect because of temperature. Number two, a wire of no dimension is a wire of no dimensions is connected to a power source set to low potential difference. The current through the wire is measured and its resistance is calculated. So if it's a low potential difference for a given resistance, the current will be fairly low. The power source is set to a very high potential difference, and the measurement and calculations are repeated. Must the two calculated resistance values always be the same? and why or why not. So the difference here is one, they're using a low potential. In the second case, they're using a high potential. So what's going to be different is the amount of current that goes through that resistor. And so the way that we need to think about that is a very high potential difference is going to cause a very high current. Well, if there's a high current going through a resistor, there's going to be a lot of um, energy dissipated or there's power, joules per second transfer to the environment through heat, typically. Uh, and if there's a high power, that means that the resistor is going to increase in temperature. And if you increase temperature, just like we said up here, that can affect the resistance of, ma of material, which uh, is related to the resistivity. So um, will the two resistance values be the same? Well, not necessarily, because like we talked about, if the wire heats up enough, its resistivity may change significantly, which means they're going to get two different calculated resistance values for that same resistor. Number three, the electrical resistance of a part of the circuit shown between point X and Y is what? And so we just have a circuit. We have two resistors in series in parallel with another resistor. And it just wants to know what the resistance is between those two points. So it's really just looking for the equivalent resistance of this combination of resistors. Remember that we can just add together the res individual resistance values for any resistors in series. And so we're just going we can redraw this circuit to be like this simplified form where we have a four ohm in parallel with a two ohm, right? Because you have a one plus three or four ohm in parallel with a two ohm. And then how do we find out the equivalent resistance of resistors in parallel? Well, we've got to go to our AP2 equation that one over the equivalent parallel resistance is equal to the sum of the inverses of all the individual resistors in parallel. So we do the calculation down here, right? One over the equivalent parallel resistance of this is equal to one over four ohms plus one over two ohms because those are the two resistors in parallel. And so we combine these two fractions and we get the inverse of the parallel resistance or the equivalent parallel resistance is three fourths of an inverse ohm. That's not our parallel resistance or our equivalent parallel resistance. We've got to invert each side of the equation. So if we invert each side of the equation, we get that the equivalent parallel resistance is equal to four thirds of an ohm or one and a third ohms. So our answer is A. Okay. Number four, we're dealing with uh, 
circuit that has both resistors and capacitors. So it says, in the circuit above, a battery of EMF E is connected to three resistors, a switch and a capacitor, right here shown above. The resistance of resistor 1 is greater than that of resistor 2, which is greater than that of resistor 3. The question asks, um, after the switch is closed and the circuit has reached a steady state, an ideal ammeter is connected between points X and Y as shown above. And so they basically stuck an ammeter, something that measures current between this point and this point in parallel with the capacitor. And an ideal ammeter is something that has very, very low resistance. So it's basically like an ideal wire. It says the circuit is again allowed to reach a steady state. Which of the following correctly indicates the reading on the ammeter and explains why it has that reading? So um, let's think about what happens um, when we connect this thing between here and it's reached a steady state. So if we're connecting an ideal ammeter from point X to point Y, like I said, an ideal ammeter basically has negligible resistance. So what the question is like, what happens if we just connect a wire right here? So if we've connected this, this uh, ammeter between point X and point Y, and it's just like an ideal wire, well, um, turns out that it really simplifies the circuit. So let's think about what actually happens. Anything that's connected to the negative side of a battery from an ideal wire is at the same voltage as the negative side of the battery. So everywhere along these ideal wires, remember an ideal wire is something with negligible resistance, there's zero volts. Zero volts here, zero volts here, and normally that zero volt would end here, but if we add this ideal ammeter, it's like an ideal wire, so there's zero volts along here, along here, along here. So basically there's zero volts everywhere except for here, right? And so uh, when the current comes out of the positive side of the, side of the battery, it's going to all go through resistor one, and it's not going to go through this resistor. It's not going to go through this, this resistor because there's basically no resistance. It can all flow through the ammeter to the negative side of the battery, which means there's no current flowing through resistor number two. There's no current flowing through resistor number three. And so the current that flows through the ammeter will actually be the same as the current, which all the current, which comes out of the battery, which also flows through resistor one. And so the correct answer is C. The current in the ammeter is the same as the current in resistor 1 because ammeters have very low resistance and it will create a short between the top and the bottom wires. A little tricky one. So question 5 is dealing with the same circuit and setup and we'll get back to the diagram in just a minute. Uh, but it says with the switch closed, the, sh the circuit shown above, and we don't have this ammeter in there anymore, it's not connected. The circuit is allowed to reach a steady state with the switch closed. And it says, let R sub EQ be the equivalent resistance of the entire circuit. Which of the following is equal to the potential difference across resistor 2? So let's go back up to this circuit right here. So the switch is closed, and it's just allowed to reach a steady state, which means uh, that capacitor will be in equilibrium, meaning it's going to reach the full amount of charge that it can in this circuit arrangement. So there's going to be current that goes across, through resistor 1, through resistor 2, some will go this way and go through resistor 3, and so there will be current that goes through each of these three resistors. And so when there's a current that flows through a resistor, there will, there will be a potential difference across that resistor. And number five is asking, what is an expression that's uh, equal to the potential difference across resistor two? Okay, so uh, it's going to be one of these expressions down here. So let's kind of think through what's going on. Well, they gave us um, a variable R sub EQ, which stands for the equivalent resistance of the circuit. And how is that related? Because um, if we have this, that can give us an expression for how much current is coming out of the battery. Because if we just simplified this and said, hey, resistor 1, 2, and 3 have some equivalent resistance, our simplified circuit diagram would look like this. We'd have a battery with one equivalent resistance kind of connecting the circuit from positive to negative. And so the current that comes out of the battery, or the current that goes through this resistor, is equal to the potential difference across that resistor divided by its resistance. 
And if this is our simple circuit, there's the full potential difference of the battery across this resistor. So the current that goes through comes out of the battery will be equal to the potential difference of the battery divided by the equivalent resistance of that resistor. Okay, so this is I coming out of the battery. Once we identify that, um, we want to think about, we want to use um, Kirchhoff's loop rule. Remember that if we have a circuit that uh, we can basically trace out a loop anywhere in that circuit and the sum of all the changes in voltage from one point all the way back to that same point, no matter how we draw that loop, the sum of all of those voltage differences will be zero. So let's say we start at the negative side of a battery right here. Um, and we draw the loop from here through resistor 1, through resistor 2, and back here. And we're doing that because we want to find out something about the change in voltage across resistor number 2. Well, what are the things we, like, what are the changes in electric potential from the negative side going through that loop? Well, we're going to increase electric potential by the battery by E, given that variable. And then we have to add to that the voltage difference across resistor number 1 plus the voltage difference across resistor number two, if we add all th three of those up, we should get back to zero, right? The change in, the total change in electric potential should be zero for any individual loop. And we have voltage going up across the battery. And then remember, voltage is gonna go down when resistance, sorry, when current flows through a resistor. And so we can basically see that this expression becomes the increase in voltage across the battery is equal to the sum of the drops in electric potential across the resistors, across the resistor number one and across resistor number two. And remember, we're trying to figure out an expression for the change in electric potential across the second resistor. So let's rearrange this equation for the change in V2, the change in electric potential across resistor two. And if we subtract the change in potential across resistor one from each side, we get this, that the change in electric potential across the second resistor is equal to the voltage of the battery minus the change across resistor one. And how do we know how much the voltage changes across any individual resistor? Well, that essentially just comes from Ohm's law. And on our AP equation sheet, it's delta, sorry, I equals delta V over R, like this, right? Or if we saw, rearrange that and solve for delta V, we get that delta V is equal to I times R. So the change in voltage across something is equal to current through it times its resistance. So the change in voltage across resistor number one, right here, is equal to the current which flows through it multiplied by its resistance, so I1 times R1. Well, if we go back to our circuit, we figured out how much of how much current was flowing out of the battery. We'll call that I battery, right? We found an expression for that right there. And all of that has to flow through resistor one before it goes to any other part of the circuit. So I1, the current going through resistor number one, is the same as the current coming out of the battery. So we just replace this, or we substitute I1 for this right here. And so we essentially, this equation turns into this expression, where the change in voltage across the second resistor is equal to the voltage of the battery minus the change across resistor one, which is equal to the current going through it, there's an expression for that, times its resistance. So all of that work right there to get uh, finally, right, that should look familiar, what well, we just derived, choice D. So that'll be, this expression represents the voltage across that second resistor when the switch is closed and the circuit is in a steady state. Okay. Question six. A student is performing experiments to determine the dielectric constant of various materials. The figure above shows one of the student's circuits containing three parallel pl plate capacitors, so each one of these is a parallel plate capacitor, arranged in a circuit with a battery of EMF B sub zero. So that's the voltage of the battery. The capacitors have the same plate area, but have different separations. And so um, you can see the separation X is smaller than Y and Y is smaller than Z. Uh, 
as shown, and are filled with dielectrics of unknown dielectric constant. The circuit has reached a steady state. So um, a parallel plate capacitor, it could just be empty air in between there between the two charge plates. Uh, and a dielectric material is just something other than air that's put in between the plates. And that's typically done to be able to increase the capacitance of a capacitor, how much charge it can store for each volt, uh, potential difference across there for like a given surface area and plate, right? Um, Capacitance, here's a capacitance equation for a, a capacitor of known area, uh, separation distance between the plates, and then uh, that K in there is the dielectric constant. And so, you know, if there's just air or a vacuum, the dielectric constant is one. And so we just get, you know, um, mu naught or epsilon naught, excuse me, times area divided by distance. And so adding a material that has a dielectric constant greater than one is giving the capacitor with the given dimensions, a larger capacitance. It's a better capacitor if you're trying to store more charge per volt applied across the plates. So they have the same plate area but different distances. And it says, the student has no way to directly measure the capacitances, but measures the potential difference across each capacitor and finds that the potential differences are the same. And it says, what can be concluded about the dielectric constants K of the materials? So are the dielectric constants the same? Uh, if some are bigger, which are bigger? Or like, is it not possible to tell? Well, um, the trick to kind of unlocking this question is coming back to the statement, this idea that they measured the potential difference across the capacitors and they found that the potential difference across X and across Y and across Z are all the same. So what is that actually telling us? Well, uh, remember, if you put capacitors in series like this, it's kind of like just like resistors. If you had three resistors in series, the voltage drop across each, each resistor would be the same. So if you had three in series, there'd be the, a third of the voltage of the battery drop across each resistor. Well, that happens to be the same for capacitors if and only if the capacitors have the same capacitance. So if you take three capacitors, hook them up in series, and they have the same capacitance, you would expect to have a third of the voltage drop of the battery across each capacitor. Well, we can kind of go backwards. They're telling us that they measured the voltage drop across all three of these capacitors was the same, which means we can conclude that if the voltage drop across each was the same, they all have the same capacitance. And so if they have the same capacitance, let's go back up to this equation. Um, if they have the same capacitance, it's asking us like, well, how did the dielectric constants differ? And remember, like it, they, it differs because they have like different a separation distance right here. This value D is, is, is different, yet they all have the same capacitance. So um, we're trying to think about uh, essentially like how the dielectric constant and this distance are mathematically related to one another. So um, I suppose I plug this in here. We don't necessarily have to. I suppose we know that C is the same and so the capacity, we could just leave this as C, but Capacitance is defined as the charge stored in the plates divided by the voltage across the plate. So just imagine there's a C right there. Um, I'm going to multiply each side by D. So I'm going to get it on the left-hand side right here. So D times the capacitance is equal to the dielectric constant times epsilon naught times the area. And I'm going to move the epsilon naught and the area over the left side by dividing each side by that, by the product of epsilon naught and the area. And we get this. That distance times this right here is equal to the dielectric constant. So how is the dielectric constant related to the separation distance if all of these other values are the same? Remember we said capacitance is the same. So that's Q or V. Epsilon naught is a constant. And it said they have the same plate area. So everything in parentheses here is the same for each capacitor. So this shows us the mathematical relationship between the distance of separation and the dielectric constant, assuming all of these things are the same, which they are for this problem, which means the dielectric constant in this scenario is just proportional to the distance. 
So as the separation distance is bigger with the same capacitance, etc., that means the dielectric constant also has to be bigger. So how do we compare the dielectric constants? Well, all we have to do is compare the separation distances. That with the biggest separation distance will have the largest dielectric constant, and, and we kind of go down. So after all that, we get that, well, the dielectric constant of x is smaller than y, which is smaller than z, and so the correct answer is b right here. Number seven. It says the figure above shows a battery and an open switch connected to two resistors and a capacitor. The switch is closed and the circuit reaches a steady state. So what happens when the switch is closed and the circuit reaches a steady state? When the switch is closed, this capacitor will start charging and charging and charging. But as it charges and the potential difference across here increases, that means like there's less current that's going to flow to it. So initially we're going to get current that flows through resistor X, but once it reaches a steady state, there's no more current which flows to or from the capacitor, which means there will be no more current flowing through resistor X. The current going through X when the switch is closed and it reaches a steady state is zero. Okay? It says, then the switch is open again, or opened again. Which of the following best describes the current in resistor X? Immediately before and immediately after the switch is opened again. So immediately before they open it, we've got this situation. There's no current flowing through it. Well, what happens right after you open the switch? Well, as soon as the switch is open, no more current can flow out of the battery. So the battery is kind of taken out of the circuit. Nothing's really going on. And so the capacitor, though, is charged, right? This side that was kind of connected to the positive side of the battery will have a net positive charge. And this side of the capacitor that was connected to the negative side of the battery will have a net negative charge. And so you have, you'll have actually, and there's a path from the positive side of the capacitor to the negative side of the capacitor. So we're going to get current flow going through resistor X and this other resistor here essentially until uh, the capacitor loses all of its charge, the plates essentially will be neutralized, right? So right after this is open, you're going to get current which flows through resistor X, which means uh, choice B is correct, that before the switch is open, there's zero current through resistor X. Remember, we're asked about the current through resistor X, and it will be non-zero after because we get essentially the capacitor that's discharging. Okay, question eight. The circuit shown above contains a capacitor, a battery, and four light bulbs, A, B, C, and D, with the same resistance. The circuit has been connected for a long time. So we'll talk about what happens, like what's going on if, if the capacitor has been connected for a long time. But then they're going to give us another scenario, so something's changing. The capacitor is now removed from the circuit and replaced with a connecting wire, like this. So Let's say there's no more capacitor connected. It's just a straight ideal wire. It says which bulbs are dimmer at equilibrium in the second circuit compared to the first circuit. So before we talk about like what changes, let's make sure we first understand what's going on in this first circuit. When the capacitor is in here and it says it's been connected for a long time. Well, we have to remember how does a capacitor behave in a circuit once uh, the circuit reaches equilibrium or it's been connected for a long time, like those both are essentially telling us the same thing. Well, when that's the case, a capacitor acts like a resistor with infinite resistance or essentially a break in the circuit, which it is a break in the circuit, right? But initially um, in a circuit, it acts like an ideal wire, but after a long time, it acts like it's not even there. So we have a break in the circuit. And so if we look at this, uh, circuit, there's going to be current that flows out of the battery through light bulb A, through light bulb B, and can't get to the negative side of the battery this way, and there's no current which flows through bulb C or bulb D. So there's only current flowing through bulb A and bulb B like this. And so, um, you know, there's no, since current can't get through the resistor, the capacitor, there's no current which flows through there, so these guys aren't lit up at all. And remember, um, if there's no current flowing through something, that means there's no voltage drop across it, which means the delta V across 
bulb C and bulb D is zero. There's no potential difference across it because there's no current flowing through it because it can't get through the capacitor. And what's true about the voltage drop across A and across B? Remember, they have the same resistance values. And so half of the voltage of the battery has to drop across bulb A. The remaining half of the voltage has to drop across bulb B. Um, and before I get into what's happening to the, the circuit when we replace the capacitor with a little ideal wire like that, um, if we're asked about like the brightness or the dimness of bulbs, remember that's related to power. So which bulbs have a smaller power loss? So joules per second, how much, well, the amount of energy transferred per second by the bulb to let's say light and heat, that's related to P or power. And this is, we've got two equations, our power equation it's equal to current through something times the voltage drop across it. And we have the, well, Ohm's law, current is equal to the change in voltage across the resistance of that thing. And so um, when we're trying to compare power for things that all have the same resistance, we want to get a uh, resist or an R in our power equation. And that doesn't come in our power equation, but if we combine Ohm's law and our power equation, then we can get this version of the power equation, right? We're just sub plugging in for I delta V over R. So we get delta V over R times delta V or delta V squared divided by resistance is equal to power. And the way that this is helpful is, like I said, all the bulbs have the same resistance. And so if we're comparing powers and resistance is constant for all of those light bulbs, that means all we really need to do is compare the voltage drops across each to tell us how the power is affected. Because for a constant R, power is proportional to the square of voltage. If the voltage drop across something goes down, the power will go down, which means the bulb will be dimmer. So out of these four light bulbs, before and after, which, which of them have a smaller voltage drop across them? Well, we already said volt, bulb A has a voltage drop of half the battery's voltage and bulb B has a voltage drop also of half the battery's voltage. So what's going on when the capacitor is removed and replaced just with an ideal wire? Well, we're going to get all the current which flows through A, right? And then some will go through B, some will go through C, some will go this way and go through D. So all of them will have current which flows through them. But let's think about this. These three bulbs now are all in parallel with one another and they have an equivalent parallel resistance. It turns out that if you have three resistors of the same value in parallel, if you use the parallel resistance equation, you could derive this, but the parallel resistance will be a third what the individual resistance values are for any of these individual bulbs. So these together act like a resistor that's a third the value of any of the individual ones which means there's less resistance here when there's three of them connected when there's just one of them connected. And so now we have essentially, I don't have it drawn here, but we've got a circuit with, let's say, resistor R, or resistance R, and then in series with something that has a resistance of one third R. And so if this has more resistance than this combination, there's going to be more voltage drop across ball bay in this circuit. Um, circuit situation than there is across these three in parallel, which means across ball bay, there's going to be a greater drop than half the battery voltage. And across each of these, the change in voltage across B, C, and D all in parallel will be smaller than half the voltage of the battery. So um, uh, through bulb A, we've got this voltage drop and the voltage drop gets bigger, which means the power will be larger. Remember this, this relationship right here? Bigger voltage drop, bigger power, it's brighter. What about B? It goes from half the voltage drop down to less than half the voltage drop. So that's going to actually be dimmer in this circuit. What about bulb C and D? Well, here, there's no voltage drop. They're not lit up at all. They're, there's no brightness. And in the second circuit situation, that, you know, they've got some voltage drop. It's, le it's less than half the voltage drop of the battery, but there is some voltage drop, so there's going to be some power and therefore some brightness. So the brightness of bulbs C and D both increased. So out of all of them, 
the only one where the bulb got dimmer was bulb B. All right, the last two questions are a, a bit easier and should go a little bit faster. Number nine, a student wants to investigate how different values of capacitance affect the potential difference across capacitors in series. Which of the following circuits would allow the students to do this? Number one, find the potential difference across capacitors and capacitors in series. And so we just have to identify what circuit, first of all, has capacitors in series. Uh, that would be circuit A, circuit B. In these two choices, the capacitors right here and here are in parallel, so like that's, those are not obvious options. So then the, the second part is, well, how can you measure the potential difference across, well, any capacitor in series? And to measure the potential difference across something, your voltmeter or potential difference meter has to be across a circuit element, whether it's across a resistor or across a capacitor. So this would be properly measuring the voltage difference across this capacitor, right? Um, this, this voltmeter is in series with these capacitors. This is not measuring the potential difference across anything, right? Uh, so that one would not work, so B will have to be correct. And then the last one is kind of a similar question, except it's about resistors and um, a parallel connection. So a student wants to investigate how different values of resistance affect the total current in a circuit when the resistors are connected in parallel, which of the following circuits will allow the student to do this? So let's first of all identify ones that have resistors in parallel, circuit C, circuit D. These resistors are in series, it's one loop. And again, A, this is one loop. And so it's gonna be C or D, and we have to figure out where would we put uh, an ammeter, that's what that capital A stands for, something that measures current, the total current in the circuit. Well, an ammeter, unlike a voltmeter, has to be connected in series with the thing it's measuring. So uh, you have to have, let's say, if we wanna measure the total current coming out of the battery, that ammeter has to be in the way and in the path of the current. The current has to go through the ammeter to measure it before it gets to any other part of the circuit. So it could be connected here. That would measure the current coming out of the battery. Or we could like put it right down here, like in this path, and that would measure the current coming into the battery, but that's constant. I mean, that's the same value. The current that comes into the into a battery is also the same as the current that comes out of the battery. Okay. So this is part one of multiple choice AP Physics 2 questions dealing with circuits. Um, check out the second video, part two, which will just continue to look through more multiple choice questions dealing with AP Physics 2 questions, circuits, capacitance, internal resistance, and the like.